open the pod bay doors, Tommy. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. What would you do with the brain if you had one? Do? Why, if I had a brain, I could... Miles per hour. I could while away. 46, 56 degrees. I'm so pleased to be here. It's, it's my first time in the movie theater for two years. <laughs> so it's... Uh, so, and, and I'm behind the podium. So combining both my passions, teaching and movies in one. So I'm very happy. So thank you for having me, Beth, and, and the College Corner audience. So, so let's start with the title, um, Sorry to Bother You. So as a linguist, I was struck by, by this film because this is the first sentence of a script of a sales speech that the main character, a telemarketer, aptly named Cassius Green, also known as Cash. So you have to recite this when he, when he calls customers. Um, but as I said to his natural voice in the movie, my hunch is that you know, his, his voice, his natural voice, his dialect of English can be understood just fine. Yet Cash is advised by remorse is on salesman that he should use his white voice so he can make more sales, so he can become a power caller and move up the corporate ladder. In this case, the ladder is an elevator to the penthouse. So cash needs the cash. <laughs> so he's got to use his white voice in order to make it. Okay? So let's listen to, to his white voice. Okay, so I have, it, I have this cute here. Um, actually, so that's okay, I'll just play it from here. Man, I'm just out here surviving. And what I'm doing right now won't even matter. Oh, baby, baby, it will always matter. Oh. But you said you fixed that. Get a room! I got a room, mother! Hey, Cash, how much longer I gotta wait for my money? God made this land for all of us. Greedy people like you wanna hog it to yourself and your family and- Me and my family? Yeah. Cash is, I'm your fucking uncle. I just really need a job. 40 on two. This is telemarketing. Stick to the script. Hey, hello. Uh, Mr. Davidson, Cash is green here. Sorry to bother. Let me give you a tip. You want to make some money here? Use your white voice. My white voice? I'm never talking about Will Smith's wife, like this young blood. Hey, Mr. Kramer, this is Langston from Regal View. As always, we'll be getting that out to you right away. You're doing so good with the voice thing. Holla, 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 holla! Yeah. Oh, yeah! All right! Going upstairs, power caller. They even have their own elevator. Welcome, power caller. I hope you did not masturbate today. We need you sharp and ready to go. Okay, so, <laughs> so what was the white voice? Actually, so in an interview, Boots Rally, he says that there is no such thing as a white voice. It's just um, a myth. And what he says is that this white voice is a metaphor for power. And this reminds me of James Baldwin, who once described whiteness itself as a metaphor for power. So in the movie, and in the US, speaking white, you know, quote unquote, refers to that one dialect that stands for upward class mobility and for power. So in Baldwin's words, code switching is all about a struggle between the social pressure forcing the other to assimilate versus the need of that other to remain authentic and faithful to oneself and one community. So Baldwin wrote eloquently, I attest to this, the world is not white. It never was white, cannot be white. White is a metaphor for power. And that is simply a way of describing Chase Manhattan Bank. That is all it means. And the people who try to rob us of identity have lost their own. And when you lose that, when the people lose that, they've lost everything on which it depended which is the bottom of the moral authority. And the moral authority is the power to persuade me that I should be like them. But I have decided that I would rather be me than be like Maggie Thatcher, 
Ronald Reagan, or Teddy Kennedy. Now, in linguistic terms, what is the white voice? Well, the white voice, or speaking white, could just be a dialect, another dialect. On the scientific view among linguists, that everyone speaks a dialect. Everyone here in this room speaks a dialect. So the idea that everyone speaks a dialect is often strange to non-linguists, but this is the reality that dialects is all there is. Each and every language is made up of a variety of dialects, and even idiolects, if you look at it from the individual perspective. So as a film sociolinguist um, Reinreich put it, a language is nothing but a dialect with an army and a navy. So James Baldwin and Boots Riley are right. The white voice is a metaphor, a proxy for both race and class. Both of these categories are socially constructed in order to control and oppress certain groups into assimilation and obedience, stick to the script. And often, it's a script towards the failure of those that are made to feel other. So linguist Lippi Green, Rosina Lippi Green, has documented the ways in which this social construction of the white voice starts from the crib onward, for example, through Disney cartoons. Disney's choices of languages, language varieties, and images teach children how to hate others and themselves and to adore the white voice. This teaching to discriminate uses stereotypes that are often anti-black, anti-Semitic, anti-women, anti-queer. In the case of anti-blackness, these stereotypes work by using black English speech patterns to consistently index the bad guys. In my own experience, this sort of hatred is promoted even in a movie, in, in a Disney movie like um, what you see on the, the top right, um, The Prisoner and the Frog, with black characters, but this time through stereotypes about voodoo. So white supremacy starts early, so parents and teachers beware. As someone who was born and grew up in Haiti and whose native language is Haitian Creole, known as Creole in Haiti, I was told in most of my youth that I needed to, to speak French, to use my French voice, so I could become a good boy, a good student, and eventually a power speaker, a, power, a powerful Haitian. So this movie struck a chord in me, thinking of French in Haiti as the white voice, the reason is that in Haiti, everyone, everyone speaks Creole. This fact is recognized in Haitian law since 87, when the Constitution recognized Creole as Haiti's sole national language. And it made Creole an official language alongside French. Note, though, that French in Haiti still remains the white voice, like in, like in uh, Sorry to Bother You, meaning that it's artificially constructed um, as a commodity. It's French that's constructed to be the main language of education, administration, justice, and so on. So from the, from the tender age, um, Haitian children are, are, who, who are caught speaking Creole in the classroom are often told, exprimez-vous, meaning express yourself, as if Creole is not even a language. In some schools, there are even posters like this one that say, I must always speak French at school, otherwise I'm the gorilla of the classroom. This is to children who are you know, six, seven, eight, nine. All of this social pressure turns French in Haiti as a countrywide bluest eye. For those of you who know uh, Morrison's novel, The Bluest Eye. It's important to stress that this sort of linguistic discrimination is part of more general patterns of racial discrimination. The language issue is only one reflex of racism, systemic racism and injustice. So this photo on the top left is the cover of my diary notebook from kindergarten. If you've read any Morrison's um, The Bluest Eye, and if you remember the tragedy of the little black girl, Pecola, who wants blue eyes, what I'm saying here is familiar. Like most kids in Haiti, I grew up with images of white children speaking French as tenses of beauty, of racial beauty. So in Haiti, the Bluest Eye Syndrome, as described by Tony Morrison's work, affects an entire nation. So we can look at this white voice or French voice or bluest eye in Haiti from a, social, um, from a social class and geopolitical perspective. So this perspective can help us understand the historical and political foundations of the racism and classism um, that you'll see in Sorry to Bother You. So let's, let's uh, watch this. So, so here, what you're going to see here are two presidents 
from France and from Haiti. And, and please pay attention to what they are saying. Nous avons évoqué les sujets de développement en Haïti, les sujets politiques aussi, sujets de développement parce qu'il y a des coopérations importantes. Le président Martelly va rencontrer des entreprises françaises. Il y a à la fois projet actuellement en développement pour l'hôpital, pour le développement des quartiers d'Haïti. Et moi-même, j'aurais sans doute allé en Haïti ou l'année prochaine ou en 2016, mais le plus tôt sera le mieux. Enfin, il y a la francophonie. C'est un lien majeur que la langue française nous permet d'avoir avec Haïti. Et nous faisons en sorte qu'il y ait, dans les lycées qui sont construits aujourd'hui en Haïti, le plus d'enseignements en français par des Français quand c'est possible ou par des francophones, parce que nous ne voudrions pas que ce qui fait l'identité d'Haïti, la langue française, puisse se perdre. La question des élections, par exemple, le renforcement du système éducatif en Haïti, parce que parler de reconstruire Haïti a à voir aussi avec reconstruire la mentalité haïtienne, l'homme haïtien, donc l'éducation, qui est la promesse faite par le président à travers un partenariat où, par exemple, des, des professeurs à la retraite pourraient venir à Haïti et nous aider à fournir l'éducation adéquate à nos jeunes haïtiens. Et ce serait assez intéressant parce que ça c'est un passage obligé formé des jeunes. Okay, so now this is another um, stage in that same process of hegemony, really. So this is Macron and Moïse. La francophonie est également un élément qui nous unit, Haïti faisant partie justement des membres fondateurs, et je souhaite que nous puissions encourager la région de manière très concrète, et nous allons nous y employer des initiatives que vous prenez en ce sens. Vous pouvez compter sur nous. Nous sommes en train de travailler pour, pour que le français, comme nous l'avons si bien dit, qui est notre langue officielle, soit en fait euh, euh, une langue, la langue de la CARICOM aussi. So, so, so here, Moïse says that French is our official language in the singular, when we have actually two official languages, and, and Creole is the national one. So to, to fully understand why these two videos um, of French and Asian presidents bear, uh, bear on, um, sorry to bother you, we have to go back in time um, to, to the history of Haiti, to colonial Haiti, um, to understand what happened in the real revolution in the 18th century that took place um, in, in Haiti. So, and that's perhaps, that slide here, is perhaps the most important part of the of my presentation. Because taken together, these two triangles that you see here, one for the whites in Haiti, owner, manager, overseer, skilled worker, and the one for the blacks, overseer, domestic slave, etc. Um, they schematize a social structure of the plantation. And it's an hierarchy based on occupation um, in the capitalist system. So the plantation owners and managers are at the top of the hierarchy, both in terms of economic power and also political power. Then right below um, come the white and black overseers, also called commanders or slave drivers. Uh, and then it's the white skilled workers, also called petit blanc, little white. And then it's the enslaved blacks working in the, in the big houses on the plantations, the so-called house slaves. And then at the very bottom of this pyramid, you have the enslaved blacks um, on the fields. These are called often the bossal. So thinking of it from, from this issue of the white voice, switching from the black voice to the white voice, code switching, um, the most interesting element in this, in this structure is the black overseers who, and here I quote Jacques Arens, they occupied an intermediate position between the white owner and the black workforce. So, to, uh, so for the overseer is the one that, that executes punishment, um, decides on tasks for the, for the enslaved um, Africans, and, and so these differences in power often connect with differences in language use. So among the blacks, the overseer is the one with the most contact with, with the white um, owners, the white colonists, because they have to discuss the management of the plantations together. And as you go down the pyramid, you have the, you have the, um, the, the house slaves and then those who work on the fields, right? And one key fact to keep in mind is that uh, often the black overseers, the black slave drivers, would be a quote unquote Creole, meaning that they were born in the colony and they had most fluency in the European language, in this case in, in French. And the ones in the, in the fields, they, 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 were, they were the Bossal. And often it was taken that the Creole had more value than the Bossal. In fact, it was even quantified that some, the, Bos, the, the Creole was worth um, 
five third the value of the of the bosal. Um, so the bosal was worth three fifths of that of the of the of the of the Creole. So and now what we could do is to draw a third triangle um, of, of languages with French at the top, Creole in the middle, and African languages at the very bottom. So and there's another key point to keep in mind as you watch the film is the fact that the overseer, even though they had authority over the other enslaved Africans on the plantation, even though they did benefit from the power structure, it's, it's them, it's the black overseers who would eventually play a key role in the Haitian Revolution. Perhaps the most famous of these overseers was Bukman. He, he was the leader in the Boakayima ceremony of August 1791 that launched the Haitian Revolution. And that's a revolution that, at the end of the 18th century, subverted um, the colonial system. We beat an army that was sent by Napoleon, and that launched the Black Lives Matter movement before there were hashtags. So, um, so now, going back to the code switching um, from the black voice to the white voice, we must note that in, in, during the revolution, it's Creole, not French, that became the language of the, of the, of the revolution because of its power to unite Africans from diverse ethnic groups and social classes into a new emerging nation. The Saline that you can see here was one of the revolution's most formidable leaders, um, and he was Haiti's first chief of state. The Saline understood very early on the importance of Creole and how the French language could be used to re-colonize Haiti, as you could see from Macron and from Hollande. So the Saline understood the political dimension of code switching long before the term was coined. And, and as his army was fighting against Napoleon's army, which they eventually defeated, um, he stated, we have our own language. Why look for other people's languages? Um, and the Senate was also a defender of the poorest of the population, the black Africans, um, descendants of the Bosal, who could not code switch. Those who were being deprived of land ownership, while the quote unquote mulattoes who were, were claiming the rights to the land of the of the of their white fathers, um, and one of the Saline's most famous quote is that, "And those blacks whose ancestors are all from Africa, won't they have any land?" Um, but the Saline was eventually assassinated, and today it's those who speak French in Haiti who are the most powerful, and most of the country's wealth is in the hands of light-skinned Haitians. So, ask yourself: Will the story to bother you have a similar ending? So, no spoilers. Um, so, I'll take you to our efforts in today at MIT Haiti um, to try to repair this state of affairs. So since Creole was indeed the length of the, of, the, of the revolution in the 18th century already, many of us in Haiti believe that Creole can also, be, can also bring victory to the people in the 21st century. So in the, in the MIT Haiti that I helped lead, uh, we, what we're doing, we're using Creole as the main tool for, for instruction. And, and the results are spectacular. So, so here, what you can see is just one graph with, um, that shows you that using the mother tongue of the children gives better results than the millions of dollars that NGOs have invested in Haiti. So in this study, you have third graders who learn in French in schools that, that receive funds, say, from the World Bank. They read less than 23 words per minute. Um, while in the Matenwa school, a school where that, um, we've worked with, um, third graders who learn in Creole um, can read more than 60 words per minute. So with more time, I'll go into the details of this, but the, the, there is good news. Um, as the mother tongue model spreads to other schools, the results are spectacular. As we should expect from the perspective of linguistics and education, where learners' native language is a key ingredient for, for learning gains. So meanwhile, um, in the US, and to come back to the film, sorry to bother you, Negative attitudes towards black English have been central in the movement against black lives. So this point is important because most supporters of the Black Lives Matter movement, even the most well-meaning supporters, seem unaware of the centrality of language in our struggle. So let's go back to the very beginning of the Black Lives Matter movement in Florida at the end of the trial of George Zimmerman on July 13, 2013. Recall that George Zimmerman was the one to kill Trevon Martin. Um, so that's Trevon Martin here. And Rachel Gentel was the star witness for the prosecution. Gentel was on the phone with Martin during the last moments of his life before he got shot by Zimmerman. Key linguistic detail. Rachel Gentel is a speaker of black English, AAE, African American English. She was on the stand for 
almost 16 hours, testifying for the prosecution. But the jurors found her not reliable and, quote, hard to understand. And as Rickford and King, two linguists, report, no one mentioned Gentile in 16 hours of jury deliberation. A testimony played no role whatsoever in the decision. As they put it, gentle verdict was, gentle dialect, her dialect was found guilty before Zimmerman was found innocent, unquote. The reason was because she could not code switch to the white voice. So because of her lack of, of the white voice, she was deemed to be untrustworthy. So in my class at MIT, we often discuss how this analysis um, extends to courts worldwide, even in Haiti, where you know, the judges, the accused are all black, but using French is a denial of justice for cruel speaking Haitians. So we have this very similar pattern. And that's why I think it's very important for us to think of the role of language in the Black Lives Matter movement. So I'm sorry to bother you. <laughs> Thank you.